name's Justine. I am very much in the early part of recovery. I guess I have been uh, trying to be sugar and flour free since maybe the sort of middle middle of April, end of April. Um, my story is, I, I feel there's, a, there's almost like a sort of um, numbness to me at the moment when I think back and I haven't I'm not able to piece any of that together yet I don't think it is it's it's necessarily traumatic it's just I've been medicating with alcohol and sugar for so long now that this is all new to me so I started to try and think about some of my first memories of sugar and I definitely remember being rewarded which is a strange word because I, I remember my brother being born when I was about seven and I was given a packet of like munchies it was like a kind of thing in the UK they're like chopped up kind of caramel sweets and I wasn't particularly happy about having this brother that was born but looking back it makes me laugh that I was I was given a packet of sweets for this kind of this 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 child to arrive um and I remember car journeys with my mum and we would, you know, we'd go on this kind of long car journey and she would give us both a bag of sweets and it was like a five hour journey to get to my granny's house. And he would like demolish his, uh, sorry, I would demolish mine within like five, 10 minutes. And four hours later, he'd start pulling out the sweets. Um, I've also got this memory of stealing kind of these cola fizzy bottles from my friend's house and I remember going into this lovely big pantry and there was all these great big um, sort of jars of sweets and we kind of stuff them my hand in and taking them out and I remember uh, my friend's mum just looking at me and that kind of feeling I'd be about I don't know, nine or ten and I, I can still almost go as red then as I, as I felt like the shame is almost 40 years ago and I, I remember that kind of feeling so that's my sugar memories from being young mid-teens alcohol very quickly became a thing with me um I remember just a kind of fuzzy feeling I drank and that was that was me um and it took me years to connect anything I just carried on drinking it's what it's what I did everybody knew me as I was fun, I was crazy, I did things that I'm not proud of, I did, alcohol was just this massive part of my life. Um, but going back to, to, to sugar briefly, when I was about 20, I went to New York and I kind of was in America for about, I don't know, nine or 10 weeks, something like that. And I remember just being absolutely, um, the glamour of these kind of 24 seven cafe type things and places that we didn't have or we didn't have in sort of small town UK. I remember like standing outside and you could get this like freshly made sandwich at like midnight and just things. And, and I came home and I was about 30 pounds heavier in 10 weeks, but I was a kind of oblivious to that. I think it was only really my parents that were a bit shocked and it was like, I hadn't, I just hadn't taken it on. I just carried on. I was just drinking, 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 you know, blackouts, functioning alcoholic all throughout my twenties and my thirties. Um, every occasion, every single occasion I could think of, you know, whether it was my daughter's third, fourth birthday party, whatever, there was, you know, alcohol was, was there. Um, so I kind of got to my early, 40s and met up with a childhood sweetheart and we, we we quite quickly got got married and everything was looking great and then literally five weeks after um being married it, it, it's almost like he's we've almost had like this kind of ultimatum where I've got to stop drinking because my uh, my behavior is so outrageous I'm drinking a lot and it's got to stop. So um, I get to a point, it's like now 2016. So I stopped drinking with the help of an online community and um, 
and it's challenging, but you know, life's suddenly so much better, so much more manageable. And I remember them saying, just eat sugar, don't worry about it. Just, you know, eat jelly babies or just get through it. It's, you'll be fine. And then that's like 2016, and I've been, it's almost like six years and everything's great. And suddenly um, here I am in 2022 and I've got my next rock bottom and it's like April and I've eaten what, four of the kids Easter eggs and um, I'm hiding Easter eggs. I'm, I'm having to sort of buy new ones for them and things like this. And, um, and I'm shaky and I feel horrendous and I've got heartburn and um, yeah, I'm just like, this is not, this is not normal. People don't eat like this. I'm quite sure they don't eat like this. So I'm sort of looking for help and I start looking for help and I'm like, where do I begin? And I start looking at sort of online communities and I find the Food Junkies podcast. And I literally thought, I think of this kind of podcast as like I'm on this raft just kind of battering around in the North Sea and, and it's like this lifeboat just coming past and I'm like, because it literally became my next addiction because I was like, listening to this podcast and that podcast and that podcast and I, I know there's Beer and there's, there's you and there's Clarissa and I was like oh okay other people are like me right okay and because I because I don't know what what it's like in other countries I can only go what it's like and I'm, I'm in Scotland and the UK but when you put in information like I have sinusitis or um splitting headaches and you kind of I remember going to a doctor and saying um could this be diet related could these two things no no they're not diet related no you know it's nothing to do with what you're eating and I'm like I feel like these things are and suddenly I don't have them anymore I've stopped sugar and I don't have the headaches and I don't have this you know um sinus problem so um look just going back so I find the Food Junkies podcast and I think I then started to just try and get a few days under my belt and then I must have found one of your meetings and I signed up for that and then through that I then looked at your program and I was like well I'm in that's absolutely that's for me and I guess that's me at this stage now so those early days of getting sober from alcohol, they're telling you just eat the sugar. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Not realizing maybe this history that you had or that it's causing more problems. No. Yeah. I mean, I'm an addiction counselor as well. And I remember um, when I had an in-person office, phys right? People would come physically. I had a bowl of chocolate for all of my opioid users. <laughs> And looking back, I'm going, oh no, what was I, I didn't know, right? Like it, because those, they connect in the same receptors, right? Yeah. So I thought, hey, it's better than heroin, right? Like never occurred to me that it was causing issues for them or even me for sure. So now that we know better, we do better. So you're thinking, okay, the sugar's back. So at some point it got back out of control or it felt like it was out of control. It, did it feel similar to the alcohol use at any point? Yes. So, uh, you, you know, I just didn't connect the two. So there was no connection for me. I just, um, I believed like I knew with alcohol, I had a problem and that it was quite, uh, uh, it, 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 I guess, alcohol issues in women, that they're quite prevalent. But as far as uh, sugar went, I just didn't think, I didn't think, I thought it was me just me that had a problem I was the one that could not control so yeah I did um I, I would do things like um you know tripping the car on my own was like brilliant this is I've got carte blanche now I can go to a petrol station I can buy what I want but I would still I, I'd maybe buy things like uh I'll have three or four bags of those sweets because they look like child sweets and I'll have those ones because they're adult um and I was hiding my behaviors then even to the person behind the counter and then we'd get in the car and just eat and eat and eat and hide the wrappers and I mean it was just outrageous when I look back on it like how much I could eat um 
I would sit in a work conference. I remember I working late one night on a sales conference and um, there was these like Amazon retro sweets. And I noticed that no one else was kind of eating them, but I just kept, it's like this robotic hand just was like backwards, forwards, backwards, forwards. And I would acknowledge it, but I couldn't stop it. I literally could not stop eating. Have you found a way to stop that behavior or that obsession or that use now, or is that something that's still a work in progress for you? Yeah, so it's very much a work in progress, but uh, you know, with the help of the, the program that I'm doing at the moment, I'm trying, diet is a massive part. So what, what I eat absolutely um, very much dictates what I then eat next. So at the minute I am following a low carb kind of keto diet, and I realize that if I eat high fat and eat high protein, the chances of me then eating something sugary are much, much lower. Um, I have different things in my sort of toolbox that I use. Like um, I personally, rightly or wrongly, I, we hide the kind of sugary carby snacks. They're, they're away, they're out of sight. Um, yeah, there's lots of different things that, that I, um, that I do that I kind of try and I try and eat mindfully. So I used to go to the fridge and I would open the fridge and I would just start eating. It was this weird, it was about to that kind of robotic hand thing again. I would just eat. I wasn't even con you know, considering at all what I was eating. Um, and I would be taking things out. And I could maybe have had like hundreds of calories. Calories would just, they wouldn't even be, I wouldn't be mindful of that at all. But now I make a bit of a deal with myself that I only eat at a place that's designated for eating. So that in our house is the dinner table or um, it actually in the house, that's it. It's the dinner table. I've just thought about it. Yeah, that's it. So I've not really... You know, if I have to go into the city or something, then it might be that I'll go and find a place, but I need to be sat down. So there's no just mindful, uh, uh, sorry, not mindful, no just kind of mindless grazing. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Designated. So it's not over the sink. It's not like <laughs> going to the bathroom really quick. So the children aren't like, mom, what are you doing? It's not in the car, that no. kind of thing. Yeah. So that does bring up a really great question for you because you do have younger children in the home and mm. does that make it more difficult to get some of those trigger foods out completely or hidden I mean how do you manage that I imagine you're still kind of touching manipulating those things for others can you talk a little bit about that yeah sure so um yeah I have a five-year-old almost five and 15 year old um, and, you know, they're both, I guess they're both starting the day with kind of like carby type, traditionally what I consider to be a healthy breakfast, you know, whether it's like a granola or toast or, or things like that. Um, so I begin my day by, um, I, I kind of, um, I wake up and the, the, the sort of the first thing I do is I actually check my WhatsApp group and it it just is amazing because of the time difference there's always loads of messages so that have happened throughout the night so it gives me this really lovely sort of start to the day which is so polar opposite to how I used to feel when I woke up and I wake up and I do that and then I go downstairs and I make myself a kind of coffee and I just and I'm, you know, have my coffee and I go and walk the dog and that gives me time to consider my next moves. And I, so I'm not going to put myself in a dangerous position. And it might be that I'll eat something like whether it's protein or something, but I'm ready for then that next bit, which is the five-year-old saying, can I have breakfast? Da, da, da. So I just kind of do it in a way where I'm just really not touching it, not really thinking about it, just putting it away. And in the back of my mind, I'm also thinking, right, how can I, how can I change this up for the future? What can I do to give them a better start? Um, and as far as the really carbage type things, that they're, they're away. I have them away and they're kind of 
and, and then so we have the, the fruits out um and i will just i'll encourage things like have have some carrot sticks or have some fruit or have this rather than you know have a, a sugary um whatever snack but if they want it then then they have to kind of go and ask and it's out of my sight at the moment at the minute <laughs> I mean, similar in my house, my children are <laughs> nine and six and every meal there's animal protein. So there's meat <laughs> and yeah. there are still yeah, some right. of those other options because my husband doesn't eat the same way that I do either. But yeah, I mean, we keep it out of sight, out of mind. So it's like behind pantry closed doors or up on top of like the refrigerator or a cabinet, they have to ask it's not just a free for all and that it's, um, but that it's also not demonized, right. That they're, if they want it, you know, unless there's a really good reason for them not to have it, we generally say, yes, they get their reasonable portion and away they go. My children still have Christmas candy. I mean, like that's how <laughs> little interest they have in candy. So when they ask for it, it's not really hard for me to say, Yes, because they so infrequently ask for it. And I think some of it is because of this keeping it, you know, out of sight, out of mind, but also we're not like constantly like talking poorly about it. So they're not always thinking about it. I mean, it sounds like you're mm -hmm. like, you're doing very similar things and, and then it minimizes the amount you have to touch it too. I mean, having a 15 year old has to help. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah, that, that's, but also, you know, she knows if she really wants something that 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 I won't put in the house or whatever then she has to walk to a shop you know so fine you know go and walk go and do some exercise and then you can go and get that thing you really really want if that's the case because also I don't want to put what I hope are my issues onto the rest of the family because to the rest best of my knowledge you know my husband can have a whiskey or a chocolate bar and then not have one for another four months, which is like, you know, amazing. But I can't imagine being like that. <laughs> right? No, it's so true. It's kind of um, interesting to live with somebody and just observe it, but also to know our truth, like that just isn't for us. No. So, you know, you kind of talked about, okay, when you start your morning, you yes. check out the WhatsApp group. Are there yeah. other things that you do for yourself during the day to protect like the alcohol recovery or what you're trying to do with the food, you know, do you have like routines or, or like yeah. non-negotiables that have to happen? Yeah, I do. And I've just, I've just written a few notes. So I'm just going to kind of refer to these a little bit. So yeah, I, 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 I checked my WhatsApp group, as I say, the dog, the dog walk is, is, um, is a really important start to my day. It just gives me, just gives me time. I get out of the house, I get the kind of sun on my face. Um, and then I have this, uh, I call it like my, my, my green book. It's like my kind of, it's just like I refer to everything and I write things throughout the day. So I'll like, you know, progress over perfection or, you know, um, protein is prioritize your protein, things like that, reach out. And it, it just, I kind of find this so valuable. It's such an amazing thing to have next to me. Um, so I write, um, I listen to podcasts so yesterday I um I just reached out to my group and I said anybody does anybody have any new podcasts and straight away I just got this big text back with all these different podcasts I could listen to which was amazing I drink water which I never did my coffee and tea intake were off the scale um so I try and drink lots of water and I personally find that for me that the low carb kind of keto style diet is working and I'm thankful I try and be thankful for things that maybe I wouldn't have you know thought of before so again I, I each day I sort of I'll thank the group in some way just say thank you for being here or, you, know, you guys are great it just makes a difference it makes a huge difference so with the group and, and what you're doing in the group and you know for people watching you guys may not know what group we're even referring to we're running um, research on treatment. We're auditing treatment that's been used for other substances of abuse, um, other uh, addiction behavior, like gambling, that kind of thing. And we're, we're tailoring it to the food. And so uh, Justine is kind enough to be going through a group that's auditing that. Um, and we're collecting data 
And because of that, we're finding that it's beneficial to people and um, in general. <laughs> and so there's a paper coming, all of that. And Clarissa and I are actually the namesake of this YouTube channel, Sweet Sobriety and the group. We're launching a, a business, you know, a treatment option, online treatment option with the same name based on this research. And so I'm wondering, you know, just because I am curious to know if for you specifically, there's been, I know, I know your group is only halfway through, um, mm -hmm. but so far to date, has there been anything that you found more impactful or more um, helpful to you and your journey along the way? Is there anything specific that you, that comes to mind? I think you just touched on it there, but the whole cross addiction was just like, it was so incredibly eye opening to, to obviously have a background in, you know, drinking too much alcohol. And then I, when I stopped drinking, I started exercising. And then next thing I was, I was running for like a couple of miles, three miles, four miles. And the next thing I signed up for a marathon and um, everybody else was like, Justine, you've only been running for you know, X amount of time. And I was like, no, 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 I can do this. And I remember, like, I thought it was the most normal thing in the world. And then the same with the sugar just a few weeks ago, next thing I'm buying things online and I'm spending more and more time on my phone and my husband's questioning the amount of time on my phone. And I'm sort of saying to him, no, no, it's fine. It's fine. I have to check it because of this or that. And then the group started to, to, talk about this and I started to think actually maybe this is nothing to do with <laughs> me needing to check my phone maybe this is part of my addiction maybe this is cross addiction one thing leads to the next thing so that is fascinating for me at the minute and I've, I'm on the really early stages of learning about that yeah it, and you know it's so interesting because there was a time when clinically we thought that there were multiple addictions, right? That somebody yeah. would have an addiction to cocaine and heroin and, you know, then it was poly substance abuse or whatever. And now we know it's literally one disease and it has many outlets and it's like playing this game of whack-a-mole and you guys may not have it in Scotland or the UK, but it, you know, do you know what whack where it's yes. like the little thing would pop up and you, yeah, yeah and do. it would pop up in another hole. And that's what a, what this can often be like, um, you know, so that's why I like to know, like, what are the things that people do during the day that really to take care of ourselves, because we're trying to fill this hole, or, you know, whatever, there's something missing, it's an unmet need. And mm -hmm. the the substance or the behavior just kind of becomes the, the emotional grab that we're hoping will fix it. And it does temporarily, usually, right? But then it like never lasts long. And then we need more and more and more to get the same effect, or we've got to do it longer to get the same effect. And so, yeah, I mean, I think that's really neat to hear that that module has been helpful for you because I think you're right. Like a lot of people don't know, or we think we have five different addictions going on and we're going, oh my goodness, I'm so, so sick. There's no help for me, but really it's the same. It's just, it's the same. It's just showing up in different ways and we can actually just treat it as one and they all kind of start to calm down a little bit. I mean, have you found that to be true? Like if you equate the alcohol and the sugar and the spending and the exercise as one thing, does it feel more manageable? Yeah, I found a, an element of peace that I just didn't think was in me. And that's happened quite relatively quickly once you get through the initial, um, you know, the withdrawals and those kind of that discomfort. There's a, there is actually one, I suppose it's that recognizing how I'm feeling and recognizing what it is and just, just almost talking to it and saying, oh, okay, it's you, I get you, okay. You can just get back in your box a minute and I'm just going to acknowledge you and then I can kind of think about my next step that just I mean I'm doing things like breathing differently that I never thought I would do you know I'm not <laughs> these are not things that I do I don't calm down I I I don't sit for lengths of time I don't really think about my behaviors I've not been in therapy there's all these things are not things I keep using the word thing so, but um this is new to me it's really new 
So recognizing these um, feelings are they're just are so important. And uh, yeah, the, a real sense of peace that life's going to be okay. So when you're not working or being a mom or a, a, a partner or um, any of those things, what are you doing? Like, what do you like to do in your free time? What fills your cup? What brings you joy? Yeah. Okay. So I, uh, you know, I'm, I'm really fortunate that I get to study now. So I have, I'm back studying art after years of years of not being able to fulfill that dream. And and that's partly because I, um, because I was able to, 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 to get rid of that chaotic, truly chaotic life I had with, with drinking. But I could still see that I wasn't really being able to fulfill all of my kind of potentials. Well, that's how it feels. So now I, I you know, I draw a lot, I make a lot, I, I, I sculpt it's what I do I use my hands um and that takes up a lot of time you know it does does take up a lot of time um and the rest of the time is probably balancing balls with the, the family but I, do, I mean I do swim in the sea actually I forgot about that I do I swim I'm lucky that I live very very close to very very cold north sea and I and, and when I can I get in the sea and that's brilliant to be recommended. <laughs> yeah, they say cold exposure therapy, cold water therapy, cold immersion therapy is really good for us on so many different levels, right? Biologically, but also psychologically, right? There's something to it. Like when we do these hard things, you know, there's um there's this book called The Comfort Crisis by um his name is Michael Easter and um he is a uh, like an investigative journalist, but he went and he explored all these different aspects of what's going on with, with humanity. And, you know, he talked about, we live in climate controlled homes. We work in climate controlled buildings. If we're going out in the cold, it's literally from our house to our car. If we're going out in the heat, it's from our house to our car, right. That we've just become so accustomed to these, um, niceties <laughs> that we don't do hard things anymore and or right or that we're not accustomed to doing hard things and so we um give up easily or that we find our brain will actually um create problems so we've yeah. done a really good job of eliminating problems so our brain will come up with problems which i think sometimes is behind some of this addictive like eating or whatever it might be right like we need our brains need like some adversity right it needs a challenge yeah. and i think this Ooh. cold you know cold swimming swimming in the cold sea is yeah. is an amazing way to just really challenge yourself mentally and physically and when you get out of the water it's got to feel like a it has to be a rush oh it's amazing it's like absolutely amazing the feeling and, and sometimes you're not even in there for a great period of time because maybe it's you know for, I, I do it every every month of every year so sometimes it's really really cold so you can only really be in it for a couple of minutes but um, the feeling is it's it's immense. Yeah, it literally just sends these kind of happy feelings through your body. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, what's really interesting about that. I mean, I think you nailed it. So Anna Lemke, who wrote Dopamine Nation, talks about that. Right. She talks about yeah. our dopamine reward center. It's like a seesaw and there's the high. But then there's right. Like we can get that dopamine hit just even thinking about alcohol, cocaine, cookies, you name it, right? We can get a bump of dopamine, but then it quickly drops. And the way to bring it back is actually to push on that pain side. Sure, so, sure. so when you put, so when you put yourself into that cold water, you're pushing on that pain side and then you get this huge endorphin rush and it's like, Ooh, this is amazing. Yeah. 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 I love it. I think it's amazing that you do that. And I am not brave enough to <laughs> do something like that you should, try it. you should try it Molly I should I should Clarissa does the cold water plunge I will do um I'll do like cold water like to end my showers I'll do that like briefly but um and it does right there's a little bit of a a thrill yeah. but that's on my to-do list to like get okay. good at some cold water plunges so thank you for bringing that to my attention <laughs> so I have I have just one more question for you sure. if, if you're um, willing to answer 
Um, I, I always like to ask this question and we ask it on the food junkies podcast, just in a slightly different way, but out of curiosity, you know, what, what did you need to hear or, or what is something that you think you needed to hear at the beginning of your recovery journey? You know, what are some words that maybe were, or would have been really helpful to a younger version of you, even if it was just a few years ago, a few months ago, a few weeks ago. Yeah, sure. I think um, the importance of saying no would have been, and that it's okay. It's okay to say no. And it's more difficult to say no with sugar and flour. There's, there's no doubt about that. It, there's, there's a stigma there that, you know, maybe, you know, someone's not going to say, oh, go on, you know, have, ha, have a line of whatever hard drugs, but this, for some reason, it's like, you must have a donut, you must have this. But I say no all the time when it comes to alcohol, and I don't, I don't even consider toying with my sobriety. It's such a part of me now, and I'm so settled with that, that I, I just think I wish I'd known that it was okay when I was whatever, 18, 19, 39. Um, yeah, and just that, that the importance of connecting, c- connecting with other people, like-minded souls, that it is absolutely normal to feel like this. And there's other people there to help. And the minute you find that out, th- 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 there's such, um, there's such joy to be found in your, in your other like-minded souls. Well, thank you so much for those beautiful words of wisdom. I couldn't agree more. Those boundaries, boundaries, boundaries. <laughs> Absolutely. And thank you so much for your time, for, for being willing to show up and share and recover out loud so others don't have to suffer in silence. Thank you, Molly.